Hey there, it's Luke Maxfield of Med School Coach. I'm a tutor for USMLE Step 2, 3, Comlex 1, 2, and 3. Today we're going to open up sepsis. It's a huge topic, uh, but a very important one. We're going to go through a question stem, break down the vignette, look at how you can approach these questions, and also make sure we have a good understanding of what sepsis is moving forward. So the question here, a 41-year-old man is brought to the emergency department by his wife with a complaint of confusion. He has hypertension, congestive heart failure, and hemochromatosis. His medications include lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide. The couple recently returned from a trip from the Atlantic Ocean, and the patient's temperature is 102 degrees Fahrenheit. The blood pressure is 89 over 48. The heart rate is 123 and regular. The respirations are 23, and the physical examination reveals warm erythematous patch on the right lower extremity with a hemorrhagic bullae. What is most likely diagnosis? Okay, so two things here. One of which, again, with all question stems, a nice way to make sure you get your mind in the right place is to go straight to the last line. So here, we're looking at what is the most likely diagnosis. So the presentation itself has some classical findings, and we'll kind of highlight them themselves. But when we look at the answer choices here, just as a quick gestalt, we see that they're not actually looking for a specific organism. They're actually looking for more of a general diagnosis to get things started. Um, so here we have a 41-year-old man. The setting is the emergency department. He has confusion. He has some comorbidities. And then the one that stands out is hemochromatosis. Uh, if there's an unusual or uncommon part to the past medical history, it's probably going to be relevant in some way. He is on lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide. They recently had a trip to the Atlantic Ocean. So travel exposure often plays into the answer choices as well. The temperature is 102, so this patient is febrile, he's hypotensive, he's tachycardic, and he's tachypnic. And then we also have a unique physical exam finding an erythematous patch on lower extremity, and then hemorrhagic bullae also is kind of specific. Now, your mind may go straight to Vibrio vulnificus, which is what this organism is, but taking a step back from that, the answer choices here first can be lumped together into infection, or non-infectious cause. And so with this kind of answer choice, really we're gonna have two main possibilities. If we commit to the idea that this is infectious, which if we look at the question stem, we have a patient who is febrile, he had a recent exposure, he's unstable, and then he has a physical exam finding that may be consistent with infection. So there's a lot of evidence supporting that. Or if we commit to the possibility that it's non-infectious, of which we don't really have great evidence leading you down that road, um, if we have to commit. So here we're going to commit to infectious right off the bat. So does the patient have sepsis? And now that's a classical clinical diagnosis, and we're going to break down why this patient may or may not have sepsis, but we do suspect infection. He is unstable, and so we do have a lot of evidence to support sepsis. So we can star that. That's probably going to be an answer, and then we'll run through the rest to make sure we understand why they're not. The next one is septic shock. So sepsis has various terminology associated with it, and septic shock actually has a very specific meaning. And for our purposes, septic shock is the presence of instability despite the presence or despite adequate fluid resuscitation, 30 milliliters per kilogram. And we don't have that information in the question stem. And so in this case, we cannot say that he is in shock at this point. Malignant hyperthermia associated with uh, medications. And in this case, we don't have the correct exposure. Pulmonary embolism would account for the tachycardia and the hypotension as well as the recent travel. And although it can give you a low grade temperature elevation, it does not account for a true fever here. It also doesn't take into account really the hemochromatosis or the physical exam findings with the hemorrhagic bullae. And then supraventricular tachycardia is kind of the outlier. This is one of the detractors that would just be for someone who is really feeling lost in the question. Um, he's tachycardic, but really that's the only contributing thing there. So here we've identified that the patient has sepsis. So now, Taking it back, looking at sepsis, this is a descriptive term which has gone through a lot of changes over the years. So different recommendations have come out over the past few decades, sepsis 1, 2, and 3 in 1991, 2001, 2016. Most of the recommendations came from 91 and 2016. Sepsis 1, though, some of the terminology that came out that's important for us when we're communicating with each other, communicating with the chart, is one, in the presence of an infection can be defined as an inflammatory response with the presence of microorganisms. And that's important for us when we get to sepsis three. Bacteremia is the def by definition is viable bacteria isolated in the blood. Septicemia was no longer a term that could be used correctly. Septic syndrome also was eliminated. 
and then multi-organ dysfunction was defined roughly as a primary organ failure from a systemic inflammatory response. So moving forward to sepsis three, which is the most recent recommendations and which carried a lot of new information. So sepsis is a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to an infection. And that's important because us as physicians and clinicians have to decide if the patient's systemic or whole body responses from an infection. The definition of sepsis is not based off of objective scoring systems. Those are both predictive models and predictive values. And then as we mentioned before, septic shock is a subset of sepsis with profound circulatory, cellular, and metabolic abnormalities and has a higher risk of mortality than sepsis alone. So when we talk about the two objective scoring systems that have been historically related to this and do come up occasionally, we talk about SIRS, which is the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, and we talk about QSOFA, or the Quick Sepsis Related Organ Failure Assessment Score. Now, SIRS was found to be wildly nonspecific, but was a good sensitive marker, and we'll talk about that a little bit in how it related to patients with an infection and their end outcome. And then QSOFA was an extrapolation of an ICU scoring system, which is quite extensive, but it also showed good validity outside of the ICU in patients with suspect, suspected infections and how their prognosis would be, whether it be mortality or hospital length of stay. So QSOFA only has three components, which makes it really useful. One, altered mental status. So any subjective confusion in a patient could work here. Some sources will say with a GCS less than or equal to 13, but really you can qualify any subjective change in, from the baseline mental status as ultra male status. The second thing is respiratory rate to kidney greater than or equal to 22 per minute. And then the last thing is systolic blood pressure less than or equal to 100 millimeters of mercury. And the most important thing here is these are scoring systems that predict poor outcomes. And it's our job to identify the causal role of infection as a source of this patient's illness. So just an idea of what the SERS criteria are we have temperature elevated or decreased. We have tachypne or uh, tachycardia, leukocytosis or leukopenia, and then also objective markers of end organ damage identified here. And then this was from the Critical Care Journal back in 1992 after sepsis one came out, and it was just qualifying and quantifying the value of SIRS as a predictor of mortality. And this chart just shows how, based off of the number of surge criteria that you met, the larger your actual hospital mortality risk was. Now, QSOFA, we talked about, also pretends a risk to in hospital mortality. And they found that it was a good or better predictor inside and outside of the ICU. But within the ICU, the actual better predictor is the full SOFA scoring system, which we won't go into today. And then here's just some numbers that I think are really nice to help us ide idealize or understand where and why QSOFA came about. So when you talk about its validity outside of the ICU, we see that the area under the curve scoring systems, they really, it functioned well as a good predictive model comparable to the full SOFA scoring system and comparable to SERS, but it's just so easy to use. There's only three bedside things you really need to identify in these patients, but it was not superior within the ICU. So that's why we really only use this outside of the ICU settings. So now the more testable points to this. So why does it cause a problem? So sepsis can be identified as three different things. Either the problem is part of the heart, part of the circulatory system, and then here we'll identify this little thing as a cell. Now with sepsis, you have one, we're gonna start with the cell, you actually have decreased cellular metabolism. Due to various reasons, the mitochondria becomes inefficient. The cells are unable to use the oxygen they get efficiently. And because of that, you get cellular death and end organ damage. Two, with the vascular supply, you get vascular permeability, vasodilation. This further compounds the end organ and cellular damage because you're not able to get the blood to the organs. And then three, the heart is another part of this with just overall circulatory collapse. The heart is not able to use the oxygen it receives efficiently. It is unable to pump efficiently. And you also have less blood returning to the heart because of what was too, the vascular dilation and the vascular permeability. So all of this results in cellular and end organ damage. And then we can roll into the treatment. So the same patient with a different lead-in stem. So now we wanna know what the most appropriate next step is. And here we can obtain blood cultures, given pure antibiotics, two liters of normal saline, or give dobutamine. And so when you see this thing, we're talking about an unstable patient based off of his vital signs. And here we need to talk about something very important. 
and that's just the primary survey. So before we move on to treating the underlying cause of this patient's illness, we actually need to try to stabilize him. And because of that, your mind should go first to addressing this patient's hemodynamic instability with just giving at least two, norm, two liters of normal saline. An alternative, even more correct answer choice could be give 30 milliliters per kilogram of normal saline. But that's just such a buzz word and just a longer stem that might probably draw a question taker's eyes right to the answer choice. So here, just going through the options, obtain blood cultures is always a great first step. Give empiric antibiotics, whether this or this, you really wouldn't give those ahead of cultures if you had the option. So those are out. And then give dobutamine. Again, we have not tried fluid resuscitation, so you're not going to give this at this point. Now, the reason that we're between these two answer choices is obtaining blood cultures, although it's a great initial step, it does nothing to help stabilize this patient. So because of that, we first need to give two liters of normal saline. So when, again, when you're looking at any patient in an emergency setting who's unstable, before you identify and treat the underlying cause, you have to first perform the primary survey, just like in a trauma patient. Are they breathing? Is their airway patent? And do they have blood flow? Not necessarily in that order. So in this patient, our patient is hypotensive, he's tachycardic, his airway was fine, he's tachypnic, but he's breathing spontaneously, he's um, not having a problem with oxygenation, so because of that, we're going to address circulation first. And this takes us to the bundled care of sepsis, and this is why this is highly testable, this is why this came about, is that it was shown, although it's only a modest benefit, that the early administration of fluids, antibiotics, and then blood culture subsequently can reduce the mortality of patients with sepsis. And then the third part to this, after he was admitted from the hospital, we've given him the appropriate initial treatments with empiric broad spectrum antibiotics after blood cultures were obtained. We've given him a trial, and this is a number you need to commit to memory, 30 milliliters per kilogram of fluids, lactated ringers or normal saline is fine. His blood pressure is still borderline, tachycardic, with tachypnic with okay oxygenation. His lactate is three, and we have a urine output now of 0 0.4 milliliters per kilogram per hour with appropriate and accurate measurement with the placing of an indwelling fully, indwelling fully. So with this, the question and answers are, do we bolus him again, give him albumin, give him an different antibiotics, administer norepinephrine, or do a bedside trans thoracic echo? And so here, with the fluid or the bolus of albumin, we see that he's already gotten a 30 milliliters per kilogram, which is an appropriate trial of fluid resuscitation. So he does not need more fluids. Albumin, although used in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis or as a challenge for other abdominal problems, this has not been shown to reduce mortality in patients with sepsis. And a large part is probably because of the vascular permeability. So even though albumin is a large molecule in sepsis, the vascular endothelium is dilated and large molecules like albumin can easily leave vascular space and you lose that oncotic pressure that that should be able to provide. He's on appropriate antibiotics. And in this case, a bedside transthoracic echocardiograph would not contribute in a meaningful way to identification of this patient's underlying disease. So here, administering norepinephrine is the best appropriate treatment. So the point of this for testing is that patients who have already received adequate fluid resuscitation need to be transitioned to a vasopressor. And multiple studies have shown recently that early transition of vasopressors to vasopressors after a fluid resuscitation that's adequate has a mortality benefit. And so it's highly testable. Your goal is to keep the mean arterial pressure, which is calculated as one third times the systolic blood pressure plus two thirds of the diastolic blood pressure greater than 65 and lactate greater than two millimoles per liter in the absence of hypovolemia meaning that they had received their adequate fluid resuscitation. So our patient with a lactate of three millimoles per liter and having received fluid administration is another indicator for transition to vasopressors. So I hope you enjoyed this step. This is something very important to me, near and dear to my heart, and it's something very important for you because you're gonna be identifying this quickly and treating it is highly regulated, and therefore any piece of this is highly testable. Good luck to you.